Hello and welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verse 18, is where we begin today. We began a new book of the Bible last time, the Gospel of Mark, and we made it through the first 17 verses. So that's where we'll pick it up today. If you can get your Bible, that'd be great. Open it up to Mark, chapter 1, verse 18. The Scripture Verse by Verse website is another place where you can study the Word of God. And the great thing about this website is it's all Bible. If you're interested in Bible, that's all that you'll find there. Study the Bible with me, three complete series going through the Bible, verse by verse, Genesis through Revelation, using my audio Bible messages. Just click and listen. That's at thebibleversebyverse.com. Well, let's pray. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth, in Jesus' name, amen. Mark chapter 1, let's begin reading in verse 16. Now as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come after me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And straightway, they forsook their nets and followed him. There was no delay in their obedience. Jesus said, follow me. And uh, they did not ask any questions. They just followed him. All they needed was the word of God. And they submitted. Without questioning, without debating, without thinking. Just do it. They didn't ask Jesus, well, you, okay, you asked us to follow you. Where are you going? They didn't ask that. They didn't ask how long we're supposed to follow you. Nothing mattered to them except immediate obedience. The details involved in that obedience, they left up to God. The details were God's business. And our job today is to obey the Lord and let him worry about the details. Obey God, obey the written word of God, and let God be concerned about the results. Our job is to follow the word of God and let him decide if that means prosperity or poverty, comfort or discomfort, popularity or rejection. God has the right to use us any way he sees fit for as long as he wants to use us. Our job, our business, is to obey his moral will found in the Holy Bible. Consequently, if there is something in our life that is keeping us from obedience to the written word of God, then we need to give it up right now. Because the clock is ticking. And we don't get any second chances once this life is over. Verse 19. And when he had gone a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat mending their nets. The nets that professional fishermen used in those days were hundreds of feet long, and they had to be repaired after each workday was finished. James and John were working on their net, and so their day must have been winding down as Jesus approached. Verse 20, And straightway he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. So James and John left their father and their business because Jesus is more important than anyone or anything. There are many good things and many important things, including work and family. But obeying Jesus Christ is more important than anything. And so they left and became disciples of Christ. And I like how their father conducted himself as well because there's no mention of him trying to keep his sons from going. He lost his sons. 
and he lost some good business partners, no doubt. But everyone must be allowed to be themselves in the Lord without others trying to stop them or tell them that it's wrong simply because God isn't telling them to do that particular thing. 21. And they went into Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught. Capernaum was a wild and wealthy city in northern Israel. It became Jesus' hometown, and he ended up doing more miracles in the city of Capernaum than anywhere else. It was a very privileged city. Notice for verse 22. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. They couldn't believe, the people couldn't believe how Jesus taught the Word of God. Jesus spoke with authority when he taught. And that's because he taught the Word of God. And the Word of God is the authority, the final authority. I've said it before, if we don't speak the Word of God with authority, we misrepresent the God of the Word. And I just love the fact that it is truth. I love the Word of God because I can say this is right and this is wrong and this is true and this is false. And if I don't like it or someone else doesn't like it, it doesn't matter because it is what it is. The Word of God is truth. And truth does not change. And truth does not evolve. And truth does not care what modern culture thinks. Preachers who do not proclaim the word of God with authority dishonor both God and his word. So Jesus spoke, and he spoke with authority. And notice verse 22. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority, and not as the scribes. The people were so used to hearing sermons, if you want to call them that, from the teachers of the law in which they were constantly quoting other teachers. They never spoke with authority. <clears throat> they never just came right out and said, this is the word of God. They never did that. And I guess that's understandable since most of the time they were either talking about their man-made traditions or quoting some other teacher and their idea of what the Bible meant or what some tradition meant. Always quoting other teachers. And of course, like today, in their sermons, they did not make quote-unquote value judgments. In other words, they didn't call right, right, and wrong, wrong, and they didn't proclaim the Word of God. They may have talked about the Word of God, but they didn't proclaim the Word of God. And there's a big difference between talking about the Word of God and proclaiming and preaching the Word of God. And listening to sermons like that would be enough to keep me away from church and probably also put me in a bad mood the rest of the day. And given the choice, I'd stay home and watch reruns of the Beverly Hillbillies. Seriously. I'm not kidding you. The way I figure, if someone doesn't have the guts to teach the pure word of God and to do it with authority, I shouldn't waste my time listening to them. I stay in bed and watch Beverly Hillbillies. Jesus didn't quote anyone. And in fact, he didn't care about what anybody else taught because he quoted God. And he proclaimed the word of God. And he never watered down the truth of God's word. Not for a second. And the people were not used to this. And they were amazed. Just like today. People, 
modern evangelicals are just uh, sometimes are absolutely shocked when I proclaim the, the pure word of God without quoting somebody else or without watering it down and I speak it with authority. I'm not the authority. The word of God is. And I'll be dogged if I'm not going to speak it with authority. But people are shocked. And they're taken back. Never heard such things. You're not supposed to be so dogmatic. My goodness, have they bought into a lukewarm, watered-down flavor of Christianity, which isn't Christianity at all. Let's continue on. Look at this in 23. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out in the synagogue, in church, as it were, did you know that demons go to church? Oh, yeah. And many times they feel very comfortable, which is a real indictment against that church and against the pastor or the preacher. If you got a man of God who is proclaiming the pure word of God with authority like Jesus did, like John the Baptist did, like Jeremiah did, like the apostles did, you ain't going to find any demon that's comfortable sitting in them pews. People will either repent or they'll never come back. And I've been told by modern evangelicals, you can't speak the truth like that. you got you got to speak soft words and water down the word and don't be so blunt with the word of God. Get people to come and then after they come for a while, then you can give them the truth. You know, as well as I do, that that is a big lie because they never do it or those people would stop coming. All they're doing is covering up their cowardliness because they don't want to hear the word of God themselves. They're uncomfortable with it. So they want anybody feeling uncomfortable with it. They just want the numbers to grow. And then you can give out the word. Oh, yeah, like when I give the word of God out to you, you get ticked off at me. I've had that happen. I know it's a pretext for their love of lies, for their love of a lukewarm Christianity. I know what that is. Don't try to, try to kid me. Jesus never watered down the word of God. Right from the start, the first time he talked to somebody, he never watered down the word of God. He wasn't interested in watering down the message of God's word to get people to follow him. And then later on, at some point, give them the truth. Why are you doing that? That is such a waste of time. Why beat around the bush? Jesus didn't. John didn't. The apostles didn't. Jeremiah didn't. Isaiah didn't. 23. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out. Again, demons go to church, devils go to church. And so the devil in this man was in the place of worship, and he tried disrupting the word of God that Jesus was teaching. He was so uncomfortable that he tried to disrupt the Word of God. I'll never forget preaching in a church. And I was preaching the pure Word of God. And it was a modern evangelical church. Why I was there, I have no idea, okay? But I can, I can still, and this was like 25 years ago, I can still see there was a modern evangelical there and his wife, and they were so uncomfortable, especially him. He was so uncomfortable. He was so nervous. He giggled through the whole service, through the whole sermon. He giggled and, and was constantly talking to his wife. And his wife was being reverent and was taking notes and listening to what I said. And she, you could tell she was zeroed in on the Word of God. And he kept, he kept nudging her and whispering to her and giggling like a little schoolboy. I don't know if she was getting irritated, but I sure was. Believe me, if it would have been Michael Moret from today, I would have called him out. I would have said, hey, I can't remember his name. Hey, why don't you stand up and tell us all what's so funny? Treat him like a grade schooler because that's what he was acting like. I would do it today. Oh, you better believe I would have. I was too diplomatic back in those days. But I'll never forget. I knew he was uncomfortable because of the word of God. 
just like the just like this demon possessed man he was uncomfortable because of the word of god now he may have been he may have been comfortable when other people taught in that synagogue and i'm sure he was that's why he was there but he was not comfortable when jesus started teaching and that's because jesus proclaimed the word of god and the devil is afraid of god's word and so are lukewarm christians they're afraid of it satan's afraid of it so he works hard to keep it from being taught or to keep people from being where it is taught and he looks very uncomfortable when it is proclaimed and i just love it i got i got i'll be honest with you okay i'll be honest with you every time i have proclaimed the word of god clearly without watering and you know i just teach the word of god verse by verse straight i got to tell you i'll be honest with you i get a kick out of seeing lukewarm christians squirm and rub the varnish off the seats i just love it because i know i know that god is using me 24 saying that well, let's let's go back to verse 23 again okay and there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee, who thou art, the Holy One of God. This devil knew who Jesus was. Oh, did he know who Jesus was. Maybe the man that he, that he was possessing didn't know, but he knew. And he also knew that Jesus was the Holy One of God. No one in that congrega congregation did or did know who Jesus was, but he did. And he also knows that eventually Jesus is going to destroy him and his fellow devils. And he's worried that Jesus is going to do it right away. The devil knows it. The devils know exactly who Jesus is. They know he is God. They know he is the Son of God. They know that it is written in the Word of God that someday he will throw them into hell. And like I said, the devils here in verse 24 are afraid that Christ is about to jump the gun and throw them into hell immediately. And so we see from this that believing the facts about Jesus is worthless by itself. Just believing the facts about Jesus is not enough to save anyone from hell. If it was, the demons would be saved because they believe the facts about Jesus. Their theology is right on target. Satan is demons. They know the facts about Jesus. They know true theology, but they don't want people to know the truth that they know. You have to believe the facts. It's true. You have to believe the correct facts about Jesus. But you also need to act on those facts by repenting and receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and submitting to his Lordship in order to be saved. You've got to go beyond the level of Satan who just knows the facts. A lot of people think that they're saved and they're going to heaven because they believe the facts. That's not enough to save you. Like James says, Satan also, the devils also believe and tremble. Doesn't do you any good to stop there. 25. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. In church, as it were, right in front of everyone, this devil called Jesus the Holy One of God. And Jesus told him to be quiet and to come out of the man. And some people might be puzzled by that. I mean, isn't it a good thing that the devil was proclaiming the truth of Christ in public? I mean, isn't that a good thing to proclaim Christ? Isn't it even a good thing for a devil to do that? No. It's not a good thing. Jesus didn't want the testimony of some demon-possessed person. He didn't want the testimony of some devil. He didn't want anyone thinking that he was in league with devils. 
That's why he not only tells this devil to come out of that man, but he also told him to be quiet. 26. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. The devil gave this poor man one final shot before he left. And I'll tell you one thing. He didn't want to come out of that man. No way. He didn't want to come out of that man because it was nice in there. It was nice having the use of his physical body to do his dirty work. But like it or not, he had to obey Jesus. So he came out. He left kicking and screaming, but he left. 27. And they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. They never saw anything like this in their life. Not just the authoritative teaching, but speaking to devils and having them immediately submit. They never saw anything like this in their life because, you know what? The devils were running rampant in our Lord's day. They were all over the place possessing people. They were prospering. And you know why? It's because the word of God was not being proclaimed clearly. At least not until John the Baptist and Jesus showed up. People went to church and there were devils there and they were feeling comfortable. Hell was winning. Satan was winning. He was destroying souls. He was leading souls to hell left and right with the religious leaders who were in charge of God's people. And Satan and his devils were possessing people and having a high time destroying lives and souls. And the devils were not intimidated by the teaching of the religious rulers. And that's why this particular one was perfectly comfortable in church. He was comfortable until Jesus showed up and started proclaiming God's word. Then he wasn't so comfortable anymore. So there were many who were possessed by devils in that day, and the people didn't know what to do about it. Actually, they couldn't do anything about it, but Jesus sure did, didn't he? With a word, Christ commanded them to leave, and they left. And now you, now you can understand why the people were so impressed. What was impossible for mere man was being done by Jesus. Taking authority over devils and telling them to leave, and they left. 28. And immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. Jesus would have made the headlines in every newspaper today. He would have been the lead story on every news network. Everyone was talking about Jesus because he was teaching the word of God and healing people and driving out devils and doing things that no one else had ever done. 29. And forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. So Peter, his brother, his wife, and his mother evidently all lived in the same house. Well, his mother-in-law, Peter's mother-in-law, they all lived in the same house. And these houses were not very big either. But notice 30. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever, and straightway they tell him of her. Fevers were big deals back in those days. It wasn't as simple as taking an aspirin. And as soon as they saw how sick Peter's mother-in-law was, they told Jesus about it right away. That's the first thing they did. It's a good idea to go to Jesus first whenever we have a problem of any kind. A quick prayer doesn't take much time, even if you're in a hurry. And who knows, 
Jesus may solve the problem immediately all by himself, or if nothing else, he will lead in the direction that we should go as a result of praying. Time spent in prayer was what I'm trying to say. Time spent in prayer is never a waste of time. The sickness of Peter's mother-in-law is now in Jesus' hands because they prayed about it, as it were. They gave the issue to God when they prayed to him, when they asked him, when they told him about it. And that's what happens. You know, when you tell God about something that's on your mind in prayer, you have given the issue over to him. You have handed the ball off to God. 31. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she ministered unto them. Notice how Peter's mother-in-law was healed immediately of a fever. People didn't have cures for fevers. You know what they used to cure fevers? I talked about this in probably when we were in the Gospel of Matthew, but it was more like grannies. On, here's another allusion to the Beverly Hillbillies. You know what I do in my spare time. But you remember grannies' concoctions to cure things? Well, that's basically what they did to try to cure fevers. I don't remember exactly what, seven hairs from seven dogs, seven ashes from seven furnaces, seven logs from, or seven splinters from seven different logs, put them all together in a white bag string and hang it from, a, from the sick person's neck with a white string. It was something like that. That, I mean, that was their cure of fever. They had no cure. Voodoo is what they did. Jesus comes along. Touches Peter's mother-in-law, bang, fever gone. Problem solved. And then did you notice how Peter's mother-in-law, how she didn't have to do anything to earn Jesus' help. He just helped her because she needed help and because he was asked. He helped her, and then in return, she served him. Jesus didn't tell her to serve him, and she didn't even have to serve him. She just did it out of appreciation. And that, my friends, in a nutshell, is the Christian life. You see it right here. We can't do anything to earn salvation through Jesus Christ. He just saves us when we ask him. And then we serve him out of appreciation. What I am saying is that a real Christian does not need church rules to make them behave like a real Christian. And I despise churches that are loaded with rules that try to make Christian behave like a Christian. In fact, legalism, in my opinion, which is humble but deadly accurate, church rules are a terrible thing. Legalism robs us of the privilege of serving Jesus out of love, and it robs Jesus. This is even worse. It robs Jesus of being served out of love. Peter's mother-in-law served Jesus because Jesus helped her. The Bible says we love Christ because he first loved us. That's the way it should be. I have always, I have always stayed away from legalism. Even when I pastored the church, I stayed away from legalism. You know what I did? I, what I do today, I taught the Word of God verse by verse from Genesis through Revelation. Save people, learn the Word of God. They fall in love with Jesus. They grow closer to Jesus. And they look for ways to serve him as a result of being closer to him through the Word of God. It's not that complicated. Then God is glorified, and people are given the opportunity to serve him out of love, which is exactly what Jesus is looking for, and I'm out of time. Continue studying the Word of God with me, because you can't get enough of it at thebibleversebyverse.com. And while you're there, please remember that I'm not underwritten by a large church or denomination. This is a faith ministry. You can be a part of this ministry. Pray for me. Pray for the Word of God. And while you're at thebibleversebyverse.com, when you take a break from the Word of God, Click the Donate button at the top of the front page and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. I would appreciate it very much. I think God would too because it's all about the Word of God. You know, that's all I do. 
is teach the Word of God straight. And you can be a part of this ministry, standing with me shoulder to shoulder, helping me to get out God's Word. Until next time, so long, everyone.